Good afternoon, everybody. A couple of announcements before we start. You hear me back there? Yes. Uh, we have an exam on Monday, right, which covers <clears throat> lectures one to seven. There'll be 10 questions. They're short, or, short answer. I posted some of last year's questions on coursework so you can see what they're like. I put up review questions for the seven lectures. All the exam questions will be derived from the review questions. So if you can answer the review questions, you should be OK. So you don't have to know anything beyond that. Um, I will have office hours this week. But for those of you who don't want to come uptown, uh, Katharina and Stephanie will have <clears throat> office hours Tuesday, 3 to 4 PM, in the John Jay Lounge. In the future, they will be finding a better room, but that's what they have this week, OK? Ashley will also be doing a review session uh, this week. She's looking for a room, and she will announce that tomorrow. And she'll go over each of the, re each of the study questions with you and tell you the answers to the study questions. Anything else we can do <laughs> for you? <laughs> so she does a good review. And I think she's going to, uh, she'll, she'll, she'll put slides up with all the answers, and you can ask your own questions as well. So uh, be on the lookout for uh, when that's going to be. That's going to be down here sometime as soon as she finds a classroom. And then for the exam, we have to split you up into two rooms. On Wednesday, we'll uh, tell you where the other one is. So half of you will come here, and half of you will go to the other room. And we will alternate rooms for each exam so that everyone doesn't stay in the same room. Okay? I think that's all the administrative stuff. And today we're going to talk about uh, viruses making RNA, RNA synthesis. And um, just to give you a little perspective of how this developed historically, uh, remember uh, tobacco mosaic virus, the first virus to be discovered. Uh, it was crystallized in 1935. <clears throat> Nin a year later, the crystals were found to have 5% RNA in them. And it wasn't until 44, the DNA was found to be genetic material. The Hershey Chase experiment showing that viral DNA is the genetic material structure of DNA in 1953, which happens to be the year I was born. So that's why I'm a scientist, because DNA structure was solved that year. 1956, uh, tobacco mosaic virus nucleic acid, the RNA was shown to be infectious. So that's the first time RNA was shown to be a genetic material. Uh, by 1959, RNA was found in many animal viruses. So this is a plant virus, and people say, so what? It's a plant virus. The real viruses, what about them? So they joined the group. And finally, in the 1960s, began, people really began studying viral RNA replication. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, an obvious th thing that has to occur during RNA synthesis, or at least replication, is that the RNA has to be copied from end to end. You can't lose any sequence. Every time you copy an RNA, you have to make sure you get the whole thing. All right. Now, we will talk about this a little bit, how this happens. But in some cases, viral RNAs are made that are shorter. And we'll talk about that. But those aren't replication <coughs> steps. Those are just mRNA synthesis. So the other thing that has to happen in cells infected with RNA viruses, you have to make mRNAs that have to be translated. And sometimes these two are the same. Sometimes the genome is the same as the mRNA, sometimes not. We talked about that a little bit. The viruses we will talk about today are shown in the context of the Baltimore scheme. And we're going to talk about um, <coughs> plus-stranded RNA viruses, negative-stranded RNA viruses, and double-stranded RNA, these three down here. And we're, we're not going to talk about retroviruses today. Even though they have RNA, they get a lecture to themselves because they're pretty neat. All right, terminology so you understand what, what we mean when we say something. Sometimes we'll say replicase, which is an enzyme that copies RNA to produce genomes. So replicase doesn't make mRNA, although technically for some viruses that, where the genome is mRNA, it does. But we, we call them replicases because they copy the genome. A transcriptase is an enzyme that produces mRNA. A transcription is the process of copying DNA into RNA, which we'll talk about in two lectures. And finally, a promoter is a sequence that controls transcription of DNA templates. So these two, uh, these last two named uh, term, terms we really don't use when we talk about RNA viruses. But it's one of those things that people misuse all the time, like transfection and 
uh, other things that I've told you, but uh, just so that you know, these apply to DNA viruses. All right, so the beginning of this whole field really began with this experiment um, in the late 50s, early 60s, and what was done here was to infect cells with a virus related to polio. It happened to be mango virus. Actually, this is polio virus here. The first one was done with mango, but here's, I'm using polio as an example. You infect cells, and then uh, at different times after infection, uh, you make uh, an extract from the cells. So you break the cells open and you make an extract. Get rid of the nuclei, so you don't want those. Uh, and then you add a radioactive precursor. And you, you add one of the four triphosphates, which has an, uh, an isotopic label, so you can measure it. Uh, and then you uh, measure the uh, incorporation of this label into RNA, basically, which is shown here. And, and these are the solid lines. So you can see at about between two and three hours post-infection, you get a steep rise in the amount of RNA made. It peaks here at about four to five hours and then goes back down. And these are the PFU made at the same time. You can see the RNA synthesis parallels uh, viral, infectious viral production. So this was the first hint that cells, infected cells made RNA. And for many years, people didn't understand what was doing this. What was the enzyme doing this? Some people thought it was a cellular enzyme, uh, but uh, and it, it turned out to be a virus enzyme. So this is how RNA polymerases were identified. So that's an assay that I just showed you, cell extracts incubated with NTPs. Uh, they also found that the RNA synthesis that I showed you on the previous slide is resistant to actinomycin D. Now, actinomycin D is a drug that prevents RNA synthesis from DNA templates. So people thought maybe this RNA synthesis that we see in virus-infected cells, maybe that's a, um, a reflection of the RNA being converted to DNA and then back to RNA. This is actually what people were thinking back then. But the fact that this RNA synthesis that I've just shown you was actinomycin D resistant showed that it was not cellular and it was virus specific. Uh, eventually, people figured out that if the virus had a minus strand genome, then the polymerase would probably be in the particle, right? Remember, because the minus strand, when it gets into the cell, it can't be translated. It would have to be copied. So people reasoned there must be a polymerase in there. They looked, they looked for them and they found them. So in the negative strand viruses, I think VSV was one of the first to, to have a polymerase discovered in the particle. And they had an enzyme there that had this activity of making RNA from viral RNA. Uh, more recently, when we have been able to sequence genomes and look at the sequence, we translate the nucleotide sequence into protein, we can actually predict which one is going to be an enzyme. Uh, so there, there are certain sequences Gliasp, ASP, for example, is one of them. It's a signature of an RNA polymerase, and you can see that in the sequence, and then you can express the protein in cells and show that it can copy RNA templates. And now today we have three-dimensional structures of many RNA polymerases, so we can see exactly how they work. And this is important because a lot of drugs can be designed that would inhibit these polymerases. <coughs> now the uh, RNA template, as it is in the virion, um, varies according to the virus. And this is informative because it goes along with what the first step is when viruses infect cells. Typically, negative strand, uh, viruses with negative strand genomes, those RNAs are coated with protein because as soon as they come in the cell, they have to start making RNA. So the proteins include usually a nucleoprotein of some sort, sort of like the nucleoproteins that build those helical capsids, but they also have polymerase enzymes associated with them and some other proteins that are needed as well. So as soon as those RNAs come in, they're ready to start making uh, mRNAs. So they're really not naked RNAs, they're ribonucleoprotein complexes. Now the plus strand genomes are typically naked in the virion. So poliovirus, for example, the, the genome is plus stranded. And the first thing that happens is it gets translated. It doesn't, it doesn't need to bring anything in with it. So the RNA is naked in the capsid. Uh, there are two exceptions. The retrovirus genomes are complexed with proteins. And they're un unusual because the retrovirus genomes, the RNA genomes, get copied back to DNA. And the cell can't do that, so that has to be brought in with the particle. So you have to, the way you can tell that, of course, from the name, retrovirus, you can think, well, it's an RNA genome, it's got to go back to DNA. And coronaviruses are also unusual. They are plus-stranded 
uh, RNA genomes, but they come into the cell complex with proteins. And we're not sure why this is. You know, there's always an exception. We try and make rules, and then the viruses break them as we discover new ones. But uh, the coronavirus is a really long RNA, so maybe that has something to do with it. Now, the double-stranded RNA genomes, you can probably predict uh, that there has to be a polymerase in the virion. Even though they're double-stranded RNA and one of the strands is plus-stranded, it can't be accessed by ribosomes because the double strands is, makes it inaccessible. Ribosomes can't melt uh, the double strands, so they can't translate it. So these double-stranded RNA viruses, they bring a polymerase uh, into the cell with them. So here's an example of one of these negative strand RNA genomes coated with protein. We've actually seen this before when we were talking about nucleocapsids and helical symmetry. Uh, this is the VSV structure shown here. This is the helical uh, genome of VSV. And to complete the particle, remember, it would be surrounded by an envelope. Uh, and this protein subunit, the nucleocapsid protein, uh, binds the RNA, and here it is binding to a short stretch of RNA, and here are a number of them uh, binding to a longer piece of RNA. So this is what I mean that the RNA comes into the cell uh, complex with protein. In addition to this nucleocapsid, it also brings in the polymerase with it and a few other proteins that's needed to make uh, RNA. So RNA can be naked or it can be complexed in the virion. And the other property of RNA that's important to remember is that it can have secondary structures. So RNA is not just a linear molecule stretched out in the virion. It's all coiled up. And in addition, it has uh, these so-called stem loop structures. And these are formed by base pairing. So here in green is an RNA molecule. And wherever there's a red bar, that means that the opposite parts of the sequence are base pairing. And it forms a stem and then a loop. So eventually it has to be a loop, form a loop so it can turn. You can't be base paired all the way. And you can get some very interesting complicated structures. You can get uh, hairpin loops, bulge loops on the sides like this, multi-branched loops. You can get multiple stem loops and so forth. And these have a variety of functions in uh, RNA replication. They're recognition sites for proteins. They can be termination sites. And we'll encounter these as we move along. I want you to know uh, what we're talking about. Another kind of <clears throat> structure, which is really a secondary structure, uh, with, uh, which is rather complex, is called a pseudonaut, and that's shown on the right here. Now, in a pseudonaut, you have a stem loop structure, shown here, and then some bases in the loop base pair with sequences downstream. <coughs> all right? So this is base pairing with this linear portion of the RNA. Uh, it, what it does is form something like this. It's really two adjacent uh, stems, if you will, uh, and it forms this structure shown in panel C. So that's a pseudonaut. So it looks like a knot, but it's not actually, you don't actually, the RNA doesn't actually go within a, a loop, uh, but it does look like one. And these also have biological functions, as you'll see. So the rules for RNA synthesis are very much like uh, those for DNA synthesis. And if you've studied cellular uh, DNA synthesis, which I assume you have in, in a biology course, then all of these should be familiar to you. Uh, RNA synthesis begins and terminates at very specific sites on the template. Uh, it can be at the end or it can be in the middle. It can initiate de novo. That means uh, without a primer. And cellular uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the enzyme that makes messenger RNAs in the cell, that initiates de novo. It doesn't need a primer. But some viral polymerases need one. And uh, the ones that do, you couldn't predict. So you just have to know that, that some of them do. In addition to the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, other proteins are needed uh, for polymerization. And they can be viral in cell. And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, the synthesis of RNA, of course, is directed by a template, with one exception, which we'll see at the end of this lecture. Template directed, which means you have a RNA as a template, and then the RNA polymerase reads the template and puts the complementary bases. And of course, it synthesizes RNA in a five to three prime direction, just like DNA. So the template is read in a three to five prime uh, direction. <coughs> 
And as I said, we have some non-templated RNA synthesis. It's not, not, uh, it's not the majority of occurrences. It's an exception, but it's quite interesting, and we'll talk about that later. So here are an example of some kinds of initiation, just to give you a feel for how this works. So de novo initiation, in other words, you don't need a primer. The polymerase can recognize the template and just start putting complementary bases down. So you can see here, uh, here's the template, this green molecule. It's a three prime end. That's where it starts, the polymerase starts to read. And then the polymerase would just put the first complementary base down. It's beginning right at the three prime end. So that's the novo initiation. You don't need a primer. Some, and as I said, some polymerases can do that. Others cannot. Uh, here's another example of, of priming uh, de novo. In this case, instead of a, nu a nucleoside or an NTP, uh, it's a capped NTP, but it's the same principle. And in this case, there's internal priming, uh, some synthesis, and then the primer slides back to make a perfect match. The point here is that you don't need a primer. These are just two examples. Then we have primer-dependent initiation. And the viruses we will be talking about have two different kinds of primers. Uh, they can have a protein-linked primer. So here's a sh it's a short piece of complementary RNA. That's what a primer means, right? It can be very short. In fact, in the case of the protein-linked primer, it's two bases with a protein linked onto it. We'll talk about this today. Or the primer can be capped. Uh, and we'll again talk about this. And by capped, I mean it has the, the unusual five prime base linked to a, by a five to five prime linkage to the RNA. This is typical of cellular uh, mRNAs. And some viruses use those with about 10 or 13 nucleotides beyond as a primer. Right, so de novo or primer dependent initiation by these polymerases. They say you're one or the other, they don't do both. So it's either primer dependent or not. And again, this is uh, the mechanism of actually DNA synthesis. You can see there's, this is DNA here because we have T's being put down, but it's the same mechanism for RNA synthesis. And you may have encountered this in a course here. This is the so-called two-metal catalysis model of nu nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, so here is, is the general situation we're looking at here. We're looking at a template in the black line. There's a primer here in red and synthesis occurs by adding stepwise the triphosphates that match up with the template. And here we have a template on the right from three to five prime, and here are the individual uh, sugars, uh, the ribose sugars and the, the bases, G, T, A, T. And you can see the polymerase is adding bases, uh, in a five, synthesizing them in a five to three prime direction, C, A, and T. And the important point here is that at each polymerization step, the catalysis is assisted by two magnesium ions that are coordinated by two aspartate residues. Here you can see aspartate A and aspartate C. And you can see these are coordinating the magnesiums and these assist in the catalysis so that uh, the, the uh, nucleophilic attacks can occur uh, and get rid of the two terminal phosphates and link up um, the new base in here. So this new base has just been covalently linked and we're going to release of course a diphosphate or a pyrophosphate at that step. So the two metal catalysis model serves for both DNA and RNA and we're going to see where this happens in the polymerase. Now mo every polymerase that we know of, cellular or viral, is related in some way and this is a diagram that lines up the sequences of four different classes of polymerase. So we have RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is our viral polymerases that we'll be talking about. We have RNA dependent DNA polymerase, that's reverse <coughs> transcriptase. And we have DNA dependent DNA polymerases, which you'll hear about on Wednesday. And then DNA dependent RNA polymerases. These are the enzymes that make mRNA. So these are all related. The green areas show the areas of, of the greatest homology and these these areas that are shaded A, B, C, D, and E, these correspond to structural motifs on the enzyme. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. The structures of members of all of these four categories of polymerase have been solved. And you can see uh, why they're related. Now, <clears throat> so the, the, the fact that they're all related probably means that they evolved from a common precursor. Right? Many years ago, there was probably one polymerase. Maybe it was an RNA 
polymerase in the RNA world, and then all the others uh, evolve from that. Uh, a couple of things to point out. As I said earlier, you can identify an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase by this GDD signature, Glyasp-ASP, in one of the motifs, in the C motif. The ASP-ASP, those are the two ASPs that coordinate the magnesium ions that are necessary for catalysis that I just showed you. So in all plus strand RNA polymerases, you find this Glyasp-ASP. So if you identify a new virus from a sick person, for example, and you sequence it and you find a Glyasp-ASP, that would be a good sign that it's a plus strand RNA virus. The, uh, the, RNA, the negative strand RNA viruses have slightly different motifs. They have an ASP-ASP. Uh, in the negative strand RNA polymerases of segmented RNA viruses. Reverse transcriptase also has an ASP, ASP. And again, those two residues crucial for coordinating the magnesium. And non-segmented non uh, negative strand polymerases like measles virus, uh, VSV, they have a gly asp acin. So the asp acin coordinates the metals. Just to show you that you can not only identify these polymerases by these sequences, but they have a, an important catalytic role in coordinating those magnesium ions. Now here is the three-dimensional structure of the poliovirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So this is a plus strand RNA polymerase. It was the first RNA-dependent RNA polymerase structure to be solved. And when it was solved, it was the last of the four to be solved. And it fit right in. It aligned up perfectly with these motifs. And it was clear that all four of them were uh, related. Now you can see here I've labeled the different parts of this polymerase, uh, A, uh, B, C, D, uh, E, and F. And those, co those correspond to these shaded motifs here. And you can see that they are very specific parts uh, of the polymerase. Uh, for example, uh, the yellow, C, which is right here, that's the part that has the gliasp asp. And here are those two aspartate residues right there. And those are the ones that coordinate the magnesium. So that tells you right away, this is the active site of the polymerase, that yellow strand right there. And all these other motifs, the A, the D, and so forth, are conserved as well. Uh, the, these polymerases uh, look like uh, a right hand with fingers and thumb domains, and the palm in the middle uh, is the active part of the molecule. So all the polymerases have the same similar motif, a right hand. Now, a couple of things I want to point out about this structure which are really interesting. This is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, so it makes RNA from RNA. If you give it DNTPs, deoxynucleoside triphosphates, it will not use them. It only wants to use NTPs, the ribo-NTPs, not DNTPs. And the reason is shown by the structure. So this is a part of the active site we're zoomed in. Here's the two aspartate residues, again, that coordinate the magnesium. So this is the active site. And here is a triphosphate, an NTP, not a DNTP, an NTP that's about to be added to the growing chain. So this polymerase is copying a template, and this is the next uh, NTP sitting right near the active site, ready, ready to be added. And the way this works, by the way, is it tries all, all the four different ones, and the one that matches up is most energetically favored, and then it gets added. It has been so quickly that it can do it that way. So it doesn't know ahead of time, of course, what base should go in here. But this NTP, you can see, forms uh, various types of uh, interactions, a lot of hydrogen bonding, for example, with uh, neighboring residues. These are amino acid residues. And this one is very important here. Uh, this interaction with this ASP at 238. If this were a DNTP, there would, no be, there would not be a hydroxyl here. It would be a hydrogen, and it couldn't form this, this interaction here. So that's why this enzyme only uses NTPs, because of this amino acid here. You can actually mutate that amino acid and allow it to use DNTPs. So here's a space-filling view of the enzyme with product and template. So this is in the process of polymerizing. We've actually uh, cut away a bit here so you can see in. Here's the active site. And the, the purple here, those are the two aspartate residues that have been shaded purple. And this is one of the magnesium ions in there. Okay, that's, so that's the catalytic site. That's where the NTPs are added to the growing chain. So the template is blue. You can see 
it comes in through the bottom. We're actually looking down on the top of the enzyme here. So this is the front face, this is the top. The, pr the template comes in here, goes through the active site, and then comes out the top. And here the product is being made that's in gold, and the next uh, triphosphate will be added here. So from uh, solving the structure of these enzymes, we can really understand a lot. And I've just told you a little bit about some of the properties, but we can learn a great deal of, about how this catalysis occurs. So that's a plus strand uh, RNA-dependent RNA, RNA polymerase, and now we know many structures of others, and, and they're similar and different in many ways. So now I want to go through the infected cell for a number of viruses and show you how they make RNA. And what is their strategy for expressing the genome? Because all these viruses, well, you know, there's seven classes of RNA genome, of, of genomes in general. Uh, and the RNA genomes have specific ways of expressing their RNA. So the first, we'll look at plus strand RNA viruses. We're going to look at picornaviruses as an example, poliovirus. Uh, and then we're also going to look at another kind of plus strand RNA alpha viruses. And the first, the picornas. These have plus strand RNA genomes, right? They're positive stranded in the virion. They're naked. They come in the cell. Uh, they're translated. And then once they're translated, the enzyme, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is produced, and that can replicate the genome. And replication is very simple. You make a complete copy of the plus strand. You make a minus strand copy that's shown right here, and minus strand full-length complement. So that's what the enzyme does. And the enzyme can only do that after it's made, so translation has to occur first. And then it's copied again to make more plus strands. And these plus strands can be either mRNAs or genomes. So at some point in infection, they can be translated into protein. And then later in infection, they can be packaged uh, into virions. So this is relatively simple. The mRNA is the genome. It couldn't be simpler. And so let's take a look at how this happens. Uh, again, these. Picornaviruses, polio-like viruses, they bind receptors like every other uh, animal virus that we're going to talk about. We talked last time how we think the RNA gets in the cytoplasm. And once the RNA comes out of the virion from a, from a vesicle, then it can be immediately translated. Because it's plus-stranded RNA, it hasn't, doesn't have to go to the nucleus, doesn't have to go anywhere else in the cell, it just gets translated. So ribosomes come on, translate it, and make viral proteins. Uh, among the viral proteins that are made are the, is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is shown in blue here. And this will copy the viral genome. It takes it from plus-stranded to minus-stranded uh, to plus-stranded. Now, this whole process, interestingly, happens on membranous vesicles. It doesn't just happen floating around in the cytoplasm. This happens to be the case for all plus-strand RNA viruses. They induce the formation of vesicles. They actually take over the whole lipid machinery of the cell and they divert all the membranes to their own use. So the, the ER and the Golgi actually dissolve in cells infected with these viruses. And you get uh, these small vesicles made, and the RNA synthesis occurs on their surfaces. We think that's to increase the efficiency of the process, because it's probably easier to have things happen on a surface and where all the components can be concentrated in one area. All right, so that's how the replication works. Make genomes on vesicles. Some of these uh, RNAs that are made can go back into the translation pool. If it's early in infection, you need to build up a lot of capsid proteins. But then later on, they can go into new virions, which then leave the cell. So that's a pretty straightforward uh, picture. Let's look at the genome in a little bit of detail. So this is the RNA genome of poliovirus at the top. Again, it's plus-stranded. It's about 7,500 nucleotides long. And it has some characteristics that we've mentioned briefly. It has a 5' prime untranslated region, a 3' prime untranslated region. It's polyadenylated. So these are all characteristics of messenger RNAs. But what is different from a message is that there's a protein linked to the 5' prime end. So where a messenger RNA would have a cap, these genomes have a protein. And that protein is part of the primer for RNA replication, as you will see. Now, uh, as you'll see later when we talk about translation, RNA viruses have a problem in making multiple proteins. Because unless you can make multiple RNAs, there's no way to make more than one protein. So in general, in eukaryotic cells, one mRNA typically encodes for one protein. And as I've told you already, the viral genome of polio is, a, is an mRNA, a single mRNA. So the problem here is how to make multiple proteins from that. And there are a couple of different strategies that you'll see. One of them is very simple. You make a long protein, 
initially, you translate the whole genome into a long protein. This is like 250,000 Daltons in size. And then you process it with proteases. And the proteases are actually encoded within the long protein. So for example, there's a protease here called 2A and another uh, here called 3C. And as those are being made, they can start to nibble away at the, at the polyprotein, which is what we call the precursor. And eventually, you have about a dozen or so viral proteins made, all by the action of this protease, these two proteases. So that's one solution to being limited by the eukaryotic cell and not being able to make more than one protein per messenger RNA. Now here in the genome, we have capsid proteins, of course. We have our proteases. We have VPG right here, which is the protein linked to the end of the genome. There's the coding region for VPG. And here is our um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's called 3 d Paul. And as soon as that's made in an infected cell and it's processed by the protease, that can start replicating uh, the genome. <clears throat> now the genome of the virus, remember I, I've showed it to you already as a straight line or a squiggly line, but it's never straight. It always has some structure. And this is in fact uh, what the the coronavirus genome looks like. It has a lot of secondary structure. There is a clover leaf at the five prime end, so a three stem loop type structure. Uh, there's a uh, stem loop structure somewhere in the middle of the genome called the Cree element. We'll see what that does. And then at the three prime end, there's a pseudonaut. Remember, a pseudonaut is that funny twisted RNA secondary structure. These are believed to be signals to tell the RNA polymerase to replicate this molecule because we know that in an infected cell, no cellular RNAs are ever copied by the polymerase. As soon as that polymerase is made, it goes right for viral RNA. So there must be some signal there, and that makes sense, of course. You don't want the polymerase copying cellular RNAs. That would be a waste of time. So uh, these signals, this cloverleaf decree and the pseudonaut probably make the polymerase specific for the viral genomes. Now remember, at the five prime end of this RNA, there's a little protein called VPG, shown right here. It's about 20 amino acids or so long. It is linked to the first base in the RNA, which happens to be a U, shown here, this is uracil. It is linked by a phosphodiester bond to a tyrosine in the protein. You know, tyrosine is one of those amino acids with a hydroxyl, and that's how it's linked uh, to uh, the protein. So VPG is linked to it, and then here comes our clover leaf. And as you will see, VPG is a primer for RNA synthesis. Now VPG, in order to be a primer, has to have two bases attached to it. Just two, and then it serves as a primer. And that is VPG UU. And then it can sit down on the viral RNA and be a, uh, a primer. And the way the U's are added to VPG is on that Cree element. So if you remember, I will go back two slides in the middle of the genome is a stem loop called the Cree element. This is a very specific sequence whose function is to serve as a template for adding two U's to VPG, so you can make it a primer. So here we have the Cree element in the genome, the viral polymerase, this is actually a precursor of the polymerase with the protease attached, recognizes the Cree element, uh, then VPG comes in and sits into the polymerase, you see there are three of them here, three polymerase molecules. Those are the U-shaped blue molecules. And then at the top of this loop in Cree, there's a stretch of A's. And those serve as a template for adding two U's to VPG. So this is called a uridylation assay or a uridylation reaction. We're putting two U's onto VPG just so it can be a primer for RNA synthesis. So this is really unusual. Not many viruses do this. All the picornas do it but not, not others. Uh, among the DNA viruses, you'll hear about one next time that also uses a protein primer. So the virus <clears throat> makes these VPG, PU, PU, and then it uses them to prime RNA synthesis. Now for these viruses, RNA synthesis is very unusual. Not only does it happen on membranes and it uses a protein primer, but the template is a circular RNA. So remember, I've showed you so far these picornavirus genomes as linear RNA molecules. When they're copied on the surface of those vesicles, they're actually circles. So we can show that here. Here is, here is one part of one of these vesicles on the upper left. There is a viral protein which 
when it gets made, gets embedded <clears throat> in these membranous vesicles. So this protein 3AB is quite hydrophobic. The viral genome then is attracted to that protein through the interaction of a cellular protein called PCBP with part of the clover leaf and part of the 3AB molecule. The other end of the RNA, the polyadenylation, the polyadenylated sequence, binds a cell protein called PABP, poly A binding protein. These are cellular proteins that function in mRNA synthesis. And this ends up circularizing the RNA because PABP binds to uh, a molecule of the viral polymerase 3, 3 CD, which in turn binds to the clover leaf. So you see you have this interesting set of interactions. The RNA is brought to the membrane by a protein RNA uh, interaction. And then it's circularized by an RNA protein protein interaction. And that is the template for RNA synthesis. If you disrupt this structure, this circular structure in any way, ge genetically, biochemically, you prevent RNA synthesis. So what happens here, we've got our, remember our VPG is, is uridylated on this molecule. And somehow this uridylated VPG gets transferred to the three prime end of the genome. It hybridizes and then the polymerase goes with it. And now the polymerase is beginning to copy the genome. All this is happening on the membrane, but we've taken the membrane away to make it simple. So eventually this polymerase will copy this plus strand. You get a double-stranded product, a minus and a plus strand together. And then the same thing basically happens to make more uh, plus strands from the minus strand. So it's a very unusual membrane-bound, protein-prime, circular RNA-based uh, replication system. <clears throat> Now in the infected cells, remember I told you that the virus, these viruses, these plus strand RNA picornaviruses induce vesicle formation. So this is an electron micrograph that shows that. So here's an uninfected HeLa cell. Uh, here's the plasma membrane here and ER and mitochondria, typical normal looking cell. But a few hours after polio infection, um, the ER and Golgi are gone and the cytoplasm is full of these double membrane uh, vesicles. The smaller black dots, by the way, are, are new virus particles. This is quite late in infection, so you've already got new virus particles made. These, these, tend to, these turn out to be uh, double membrane vesicles, and if any of you know about autophagy, you know that these are generated by the autophagic process in the cell, autophagic process in the cell. So the virus, autophagy is, re is a response to stress. So when the virus infects the cell, the cell responds by inducing autophagy. But the virus says, I'm going to take these vesicles and use them to make my RNA, and that's what it does. So what turns out to be a stress response, and the virus end up uh, utilizing for RNA synthesis. So that's the way the plus strand RNA viruses replicate their genome. The overall picture is quite simple, although the details that I've told you are, they seem complex, but they're really not, and they're quite interesting. Now, alpha viruses also have plus strand genomes. Um, but for reasons that are not clear, except that it works, the way these work, uh, as you will see, they translate a little bit of this genome, but not all of it. And to access the rest of the genome here, they have to make a subgenomic mRNA. But they also replicate their genome through a minus strand uh, complement, just like the picornaviruses. And so these viruses, Synbis virus, Semleaky forest virus, these are alpha viruses. They get into the cell by endocytosis. Uh, the viral RNA, again, ends up in the cytoplasm. This is a plus strand RNA. It does not need to bring in anything with it. It comes in the cell, it's naked, it gets translated. You can see it's being, uh, ribosomes are attaching to it and you're making some viral protein. And that protein that's made, the first protein made is the viral RNA polymerase, shown here, all these NSP proteins. And that will go on and replicate the genome, make a negative strand and a plus strand. Now, as I told you before, in order to access the rest of the coding region of the RNA, and you'll see this better in a moment, uh, you have to make a subgenomic mRNA. That's done by the viral polymerase here from negative strands. You make a small RNA so that you can make proteins that are encoded uh, at the C-terminus or the three prime end of the viral RNA. So let's see how that works. So here's the schematic of the genome on the top. So this could be a picornavirus, except that instead of the VPG, it's got a cap. So now it's more of a typical mRNA. It has a poly A at the three prime end, it has UTRs at both ends, and it has a cap. So this RNA, rem remember, it's in the virion, it gets into the cell, 
it's translated immediately uh, to make these proteins. These are the RNA polymerase and accessory proteins. Now there happens to be a stop codon right here. This red dot is a stop codon. So it can't translate the proteins downstream from that. I don't know why this is existing this way because picornas don't put a stop codon here. They translate the whole genome and they process it. It just works. It doesn't make sense to us. But we're looking at it from a human viewpoint and that's always wrong. In order to translate these proteins, the virus has to first make a negative strand. So this RNA polymerase copies the plus strand and makes a full length negative strand. And then it recognizes a sequence in the negative strand to make an mRNA. So it's called subgenomic mRNA synthesis. That's a capped and polyadenylated RNA. And from those, the virus can make other proteins that are encoded down here. So it's weird, but you know, it works. And so whatever works in evolution uh, can be selected for. All right, those are two kinds of plus strand RNA replication schemes, right? Polyprotein, they're both actually polyproteins, except the second one has an mRNA, a subgenomic mRNA thrown in. Let's look at negative strand RNA viruses. We're going to look at negative and then double strand. Negative strand, uh, there are viruses with one RNA and there are viruses with segmented RNAs. And the scheme is pretty much similar. Uh, they come in, the negative strand comes in, it has to come in with a polymerase so it can be copied to form mRNAs. Uh, and in both cases, you will see the mRNAs are not complete copies of the viral negative strand genome. So the virus then, to make new genomes, has to make a complete plus strand full length complement. So we'll look first at the um, non-segmented RNA viruses. An example of this is VSV, which gets in by endocytosis. The genome gets into the cytoplasm. It is an RNA protein complex, negative strand RNA, with the polymerase attached. And the polymerase can then make individual messenger RNAs. All right, you can see individual messengers, which encode all of the individual proteins. These messenger RNAs are not complete copies of the genome. So to make more genomes, you have to make a full length plus mRNA and from it make negative strands. Okay, so you see the conundrum here. If you're going to make individual messenger RNAs, which is an acceptable strategy to get multiple proteins from a single RNA genome, then you have to have an extra step in replication. You're going to have to make this extra full length plus strand. <clears throat> So here's a schematic of the virion. You've seen this quite a bit now. Here's the nucleocapsid. Here's the complete virion with the envelope. So again, the negative strand genome is complex with proteins, including the polymerase. Uh, as it comes into cells, that immediately begins making, begins making individual mRNAs, one, two, three, four, five. And each of them encode a single protein. They're capped and they're polyadenylated. But again, these are not complete copies of the genome. So you have to go through a full length copy in order to make more uh, genomes. Here's another view of this. We've got the negative strand genome right here in this, this uh, olive color, the negative strand genome RNA. This comes in the cell, and the first thing that happens is you make mRNAs. One, two, three, four, five mRNAs, which each encode a different protein. Now, after an hour or two or three hours of this, you have a lot of proteins in the cell, you have to start thinking about making virions. So you have to make genomes. And you can't make a genome from these mRNAs. They're too short. So what happens is the, the virus begins to switch to what's called a replication. It makes a plus strand full length copy. And then from that, it makes a negative strand. Now, what controls whether the virus is making mRNA or full length plus RNAs? Well, it turns out it's the level of this end protein. So the end protein is that protein that coats the RNA and, and makes it have helical symmetry. Early in infection, well, when the virus first gets into the cell, there's no end protein present. And so all the synthesis is messenger RNA. But as end proteins rise, they begin to coat the products as the plus strand products as they are made. And that causes them to be elongated. There, you could look at the end protein as an anti-terminator. Because instead of terminating after each mRNA, the presence of end protein makes you get full length plus strands. So here's how that works on a single gene basis. Here again is the viral RNA. When the viral RNA comes into the cell, the polymerase is already attached to it. It begins to copy the first gene, which is the end gene, makes an nRNA, and then it stops. There's an intergenic region. It says to the polymerase, stop. 
and then it begins making an mRNA for the next one. In the presence of N protein, this termination at the intergenic region is antagonized, so you make a full length plus strand. Now, how does polyadenylation work? Right, each of these mRNAs is polyadenylated. And the cap, the cap also is encoded by the, is attached by the viral RNA polymerase. But what about the poly A sequence? So here is, a, is the sequence of, the, of one of these intergenic regions. So here's the negative strand genomic RNA. And the polymerase is just finishing copying uh, the first gene and making an mRNA. And in this intergenic region, there is a stretch of U's. And when the polymerase hits this, it begins to stutter. It sits in place and churns out A's, and that is basically what polyadenylates the RNA. After about 200 A's, uh, the enzyme stops making A sequences and terminates. This is actually a, a termination signal right here, the NA. Uh, and then it immediately begins to make a new mRNA. So it releases this one, and now it initiates a new one here. You see the cap has been placed on uh, to this mRNA. It's the G, M M7G cap, PPPA, and then it's making the next mRNA. So that's how they're initiated, and that's how uh, the poly A is added to each one. Okay, so that's a virus with a long negative stranded RNA genome. So the way it can access individual proteins. It's got to make one, more than one protein. The way it does that is to make independent messenger RNAs. And then if you do that, you're stuck with having to make a full-length complement to replicate your genome. So you have to have some timing mechanism to switch between uh, mRNAs and full-length plus strands, and the NP protein is it. And you'll see for flu it's the same, except this is a segmented genome. Now this looks very complicated, but in fact, there are just a couple of features that we need to look at here. Influenza virus binds sialic acid receptors. It's taken up by endocytosis. We talked last time about the beautiful pH-dependent fusion mechanism that liberates the RNAs. And remember, these are negative strand RNAs, so they get uh, put into the cell with proteins bound to them. Those RNAs go into the nucleus. Very unusual for an RNA virus. This one wants to go in the nucleus. And in the nucleus, those RNAs are templates for mRNAs, and eventually they become templates for the production of new genomes through a full-length uh, plus-stranded intermediate. So let's see how that works. So here's influenza virus, a nice cutaway here. You can see the individual ribonucleoprotein pieces. Each of these is a protein and RNA all coiled up, and the virion has eight RNAs. You can see them here one through eight, and each of them codes for one or two proteins. <clears throat> and uh, each of these RNAs, when it gets into the cell, when it gets into the nucleus, is copied to form an mRNA, which is shown here. It's a capped and polyadenylated mRNA. So you can see eight virion RNAs, eight messenger RNAs, and each of them get translated into one or two proteins. And here on the first segment, there's a frame shift that occurs to make two proteins from the same mRNA. And these um, two, last two segments, seven and eight, their mRNAs are actually spliced to give a different RNA to, to make a different protein. So there's, this virus is expanding the coding capacity of its genome by splicing. All right, so let's see how this happens and what the caveats are. And this is a diagram very much like the one we just saw for VSV, the, the negative strand RNA. So here's the influenza virus genome right here negative strand genome RNA. Um, this comes into the cell with proteins attached to it, including the RNA polymerase. Right? Remember, it's negative stranded. It has to do this. Those enzymes, that RNA polymerase, copies this negative strand RNA and makes an mRNA. And that's shown at the top here. It's a capped and polyadenylated RNA. That's for each segment, you make an mRNA, and that gets translated into a protein. Now this mRNA cannot be copied to make a negative strand genome. Remember, we always have this conundrum. We have to make mRNAs, but we also need to copy the RNA from end to end. This mRNA is not a complete copy of the vRNA for two reasons. First of all, the five prime end has extra sequences on it that are derived from the cell, and we'll see how that happens in a moment. The three prime end is, falls about 20 nucleotides short 
uh, of the genomic RNA segment. So it's not a complete copy, and therefore you have to make a full length plus strand in order to make more genomes. Very much like VSV, except a little more subtle. VSV, remember, made a lot of small mRNAs, so there was clearly no way to make a genome out of those. But uh, this one, the, the difference between mRNA and, and the full length plus strand copy is more subtle. Now, the <clears throat> synthesis of mRNAs that happens when these negative strands come in the cell requires a primer. And the primer is a piece of host cell mRNA. What the virus does, it, has, it carries an enzyme in the particle that goes to a cell mRNA and cuts it about 10 or 13 nucleotides from the 5 prime end. And then it takes the cap plus those 10 to 13 bases and uses it as a primer to make its mRNAs. So this is a primer dependent RNA polymerase and the primer is host cell sequence. So every flu mRNA has at its 5 prime end 10 to 13 sequences from the host cell or bases from the host cell. So as I said, the 3 prime end falls short of the genome. So in order to replicate, you have to make a full length plus strand. And the, the control, the switch between mRNA synthesis and making full length plus strands is the same as it was for VSV, for the negative strand viruses with long genomes. It's the level of this NP protein. Uh, when that rises after enough NP mRNAs have been translated, it then anti-terminates so that this plus strand RNA goes all the way to the 3 prime end. In addition, uh, the synthesis of this full length plus strand is, is unprimed. It doesn't require a capped primer, so there's no cap in cellular sequences at the end of this. So this is now a bona fide full length plus stranded copy of the viral genome. It can then be copied to a negative strand, and these en end up uh, into the virions. Okay, so again, you're making short mRNAs, so that necessitates a different mechanism for making uh, genomes. Now the priming step is very cool. The mRNA synthesis of influenza virus depends on primers derived from the host cell. So remember I told you the, the virus particle, as it comes in, not only has an RNA polymerase, but it has an enzyme in it that cuts host cell mRNAs around 13 bases in. So here's the cap. There are about 13 bases. Any, any sequence will do. It doesn't matter. It just takes it, whatever mRNAs can get, cuts them up. And then this piece that it's cut off, it uses as a primer for synthesis of mRNAs. Here's a negative strand viral RNA. You get a little uh, hybridization here. And then you use this as a primer. So the polymerase uses that cap fragment as a primer and elongates the mRNA. So that's why I say all the viral mRNAs have at their 5 prime end some cellular sequence. Uh, the enzyme that copies the genome is shown here. It's a complex of three proteins. And here in the olive color is the genomic RNA. And you can see it's bound to the enzyme at two sites. Here's the active site of the enzyme. And what we think happens here is that the 3 prime end is recognized initially by the active sites, and it's drawn through the active site, and at, as it's being drawn through, the plus strand mRNA is being made. So typically we think of an enzyme moving down a template, right? But here we think the enzyme stays put and the RNA gets dragged through. Now, because there is a binding site for the virion RNA in the polymerase, eventually when this molecule gets dragged all the way through, it can't be pulled anymore, all right? And this has to be released. But before it does, the polymerase stalls, and there is a U sequence right here near the 5 prime end of the virion RNA. And then that polyadenylates, that causes polyadenylation. So now you see why mRNAs fall short of the virion RNA, because the polymerase can't copy this, this part up here. It's, uh, it's attached and it won't let go. So this uh, uh, RNA, mRNA that's made gets polyadenylated by this stuttering mechanism, then gets released. So it falls short of the 5 prime end. So apparently this mechanism of polyadenylation causes a loss of sequence. And so, again, to make genomes, you have to compensate for that. OK, one more class of viruses that have RNA genomes, the double-stranded RNA viruses. Remember these have to also bring in an enzyme because the plus part of the double-stranded RNA can't be accessed by ribosomes. So what these guys do, uh, they bring in a polymerase, 
The polymerase makes mRNA from the double strands, which can be translated. Uh, and then eventually, it will take some of those mRNAs and make them double-stranded to make new genome segments. And these mRNAs are, are capped. They do not have poly A. Not every Rio virus has a poly A at the three prime end. Some of them do. Um, and these are, are very, this is a very simple uh, copying. The mRNAs are full-length uh, copies of the negative strand. So you have no issues with making up the sequence. These are what these viruses look like. Remember, they're spherical, and they have two shells. They have two concentric icosahedral shells. And here's the intact virion. And we talked last time about it. As these viruses move through the endocytic pathway, the outer shell gets digested away. So you're left with a core. And it's within this core that the mRNA synthesis actually occurs. So here you can see the double-stranded mRNAs, uh, the double-stranded genome RNAs of these viruses. They're all packed into this core. And each segment makes a single mRNA that makes a protein. You can see there are a lot of them here. And again, all this happens in the particle. The RNAs never come out. So let's see how that happens. Here is an infecting Rio virus. It gets taken into the cell by endocytosis. As the endosome fuses with lysosomes, the outer shell is digested away. And eventually, that hydrophobic particle gets out of the endosome into the cytoplasm. And then it still has its double-stranded RNAs in it. You can see the green segments here. And the mRNA synthesis begins. It's got the enzyme in the particle. And the RNAs come out of the five-fold axes of symmetry. You can see them coming out here. They're capped mRNAs. So the enzyme stays in the particle with the genome, and the mRNAs extrude from the particle. And eventually, those mRNAs get translated. Uh, they form new particles. Uh, with a single mRNA in each one, and then those mRNAs get made double-stranded inside the particle by the viral polymerase, and then it leaves the, the, the cell. So the point here is that the virus particle not only brings the enzyme in with each of these segments, but does all the synthesis within the particle. So this is really a virus that never uncoats. It never liberates its genome. Right? This is just a... Uh, interesting cryo-EM structure of rotavirus particles in the act of making mRNA. And you can see here on the bottom, this is one five-fold axis of symmetry. And you can see an mRNA coming out of the particle. Now the idea here is that below each five-fold axis of symmetry, there's one segment and one uh, enzyme. So each segment is located right below the five-fold axis. And it, when it's, after it gets out of the endosome, that enzyme produces mRNA that's extruded from the particle. It's really a neat uh, method of doing this. Now, because this is double-stranded, you may ask, is this conservative or semi-conservative? You know, when you replicate DNA, when we replicate our DNA genomes, we do it in a semi-conservative fashion. That is, the two strands separate, and then each one is duplicated. Uh, and so um, some of the double-stranded RNA viruses do this. But real viruses, the ones we've just been talking about, actually do conservative replication. They take the genome, they make an mRNA from one strand, and then make that double-stranded. So actually only one strand is being copied. That's why it's called conservative replication. The last bit today I want to tell you about is making mistakes and how that helps us to drive viral diversity. RNA synthesis, well, all nucleic acid synthesis, you probably know, is error prone. Um, and the problem with RNA based RNA synthesis is you can't correct your errors. DNA polymerases have proofreading mechanisms, but RNA dependent RNA polymerases do not. As a consequence, they make one mistake per thousand or 10,000 nucleotides incorporated. So a 10,000 base genome, viral genome, every time it's copied, you get one error in it. And remember, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of genomes produced in any one cell. So every time a virus is replicating in a cell, every genome that's produced has a mutation in it. Now, you can control this. It turns out that evolution has selected for enzymes that make mistakes. Because you can make a single amino acid change in the polio RNA polymerase that makes it more accurate, make less mistakes. You can do tenfold better with this single amino acid change. And you know what? This virus is lousy at competing with wild-type viruses. 
So in a cell culture experiment, if you put this uh, faithful polymerase virus in with wild type, it loses. So the, the, the moral is that viruses exist with a certain amount of error built into them so that they can compete. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to evolve. Without making mistakes, they can't evolve. So this will come back more in this course. We will talk a lot about uh, error-prone replication in terms of new and emerging viruses uh, later on. Another way that you can get variation is by recombination. We talked about reassortment a few lectures ago. Remember viruses with segmented genomes, when they co-infect the cell, they can mix up their genome segments and make new viruses with different combinations. Well, some RNA viruses can do what's called recombination. Uh, and this happens when the polymerase decides to change templates. So here we have an RNA molecule here in, in green. It's being copied by a polymerase. And you know, these, these reactions occur on the surface of membranes. So there are lots of RNA molecules in one very small area. And this polymerase suddenly is switching uh, to the other, to another template entirely, the blue one here. So the result is a recombinant RNA molecule. I mean, this happens, for example, in, with poliovirus and many other RNA viruses. So another source uh, of diversity that occurs during RNA replication. And the last is very interesting because it's not templated. This is a source of diversity which is not based on a polymerase recognizing a sequence. Everything we've talked about so far, we have a template and we make a copy of it. There are some cases where uh, RNA is added in a non-templated fashion. And the example, one example I'm going to show you occurs in measles and mumps virus. These look very much like VSV. They have a long negative strand genome. They make uh, independent mRNAs early in infection. And there's one mRNA, it's called the pMRNA. Uh, some of those mRNAs have an extra base added during RNA synthesis. And that gives you two proteins. All right, so it's non-templated. And the mechanism is shown here. So now this is, we're looking very close to the negative strand RNA. The virus polymerase is making an mRNA here. It gets to a certain point, and then it slips back. The, temp, the product slips back one base. You can see uh, this G, which was uh, paired with the second of these two Cs, has now slipped back one. You get a little bulge here, and then the polymerase resumes. So you have an extra G added. It's a non-templated G. And this happens very specifically in this pMRNA at this site. It's called the editing site. And it's probably controlled by a stem loop structure, which is right near here. The polymerase probably bumps into it and pauses, and then the product slips back. The result is uh, the mRNA where you've got the extra G, you make a different protein downstream of that extra G. <coughs> So you have two different proteins. You have a protein made from the normal non-edited mRNA, and you have a protein made from the edited mRNA. So they're two different products. So this happens about 10% of the time. It's reproducible. It's another way of expanding the coding capacity of a genome. One more example of this, which is pretty neat, because it really controls how, whether a virus can infect a cell or not. And this happens with Ebola virus. So remember, we talked about these last time. Uh, these are these filamentous enveloped viruses which are studded with glycoproteins. All these interesting molecules here are glycoproteins. And remember, these are needed for the virus to attach to cells and fuse and all of that. The mRNA that encodes the glycoprotein. So these are negative strand viruses. They have a long negative strand genome. They make subgenomic mRNAs very much like measles and VSV like we've been talking about. The normal mRNA made for the glycoprotein produces a secreted protein. So in other words, it, it's short. It, it has a termination codon here, and so the protein made doesn't have the transmembrane domain, so it just gets secreted out of the cell. In order to make a glycoprotein that's membrane bound, which can be incorporated uh, into virus particles, you have to have editing within the glycoprotein gene. So a, a, a non-templated base is added uh, about 10% of the time, and that gives rise to a, a longer protein, which has a transmembrane domain and can be embedded in the membrane. So here's a really neat example of where you absolutely have to have editing to have a virus. Otherwise, these virus particles would not, would not exist. They wouldn't have glycoproteins on them. Now, in the case of the measles, uh, 
editing, that's also essential because if you get rid of the editing site, uh, you, you don't get infectivity for other reasons. But here, uh, another example. There aren't too many of these, but they do exist. They also exist in uh, other organisms as well. So another example of uh, variation at the RNA level. Okay, that's it for today.